Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you on. You have an amazing um, story and just career trajectory that I know our audience is going to love to to learn from you. So without further ado, tell us a little bit about who is Jennifer? Mm-hmm. What did you learn along your journey and where you've arrived? All right. Well, um, it's a long story. I'll try to make it short, but um, <laughs> I guess it's a story of a young woman in her 20s um, who graduated college into a recession. So Mm. even though I knew I loved communications because I had four internships prior to graduation, I graduated in a recession and there really were very few jobs for entry-level people Mm -hmm. in New York at large firms. And that would be kind of the logical place I would go to work. So I moved back in with my parents And um, I started to network for any job in this profession. Mm -hmm. And I met a gentleman who was at GE Capital running corporate communications and not loving it and deciding he was going to go start something. Um, And we hit it off, but I really had no interest in a startup, literally that, that's that kind (laughs) of startup. Um, But he offered me a position and I took it because I figured I'll just do it for a couple of months and then I will get out of Dodge. And nothing about this role was interesting. You know, we had, you know, not, our clients weren't very good. We had no resources. We had a bad office, you know, everything. I was wondering what I was doing with my, (laughs) Um, and after doing that for a year, the job market started to turn. And um, my former boss who became my partner said to me, I think you're a great talent. I know this is weird, but why don't we shut down my firm and open our firm? So, mm. you know, the proposal was to be 50, 50 partners and put in an equal amount of money and go from there. Um, again, I had no intention to stay with that, but I didn't have an opportunity at the moment. So I took it mm-hmm. and the start of my journey as an entrepreneur, I was 23, 24 years old, owning half, half of a nothing company. Mm-hmm. Um, with not a lot of experience, not a lot of network and contacts and having a dream of conquering the world. So, um, you know, I'll answer any questions, but that was the beginning of this. Um, And there's a lot of episodes where I tried to, I thought I wanted to leave it Mm -hmm. because it wasn't very sexy for a long time, but Mm -hmm. I made a promise to myself that if every year I got closer to the goal, I would keep doing it. And every, mm. every year I did. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's, you know, the tenacity of kind of, like you said, sticking to it. What struck me is, like you said, you weren't quite sure, um, you know, what was ahead. So how did you get past those kind of like fears or limiting beliefs? Did you have those? Like, what were the techniques or what did you do to kind of say, okay, I know that I'm getting into this and I don't know what's ahead, but you still kind of jumped all in and you were like, even though you were telling yourself, I'm not here forever, you were still putting all of this work into it. So how did you get past that fear? Yeah. So um, the nice thing about being that young and doing something like this is you don't have a lot to lose. Mm. I was already living with my parents. I didn't have school debt, thank God. And I didn't have any responsibilities to anyone but myself. And that's a very, very lucky thing when you start a business Mm -hmm. because those are usually the fears. Will I pay my bills? Mm-hmm. Will I go to debt? You know, can I pay my kids' college education? You know, none mm-hmm. of that. My problem was who's going to hire a young woman with almost no experience and no network? Um, mm. But that was an easier thing because I was slightly fearless in that regard. Um, I have a mantra I call just ask. The two most powerful mm. words in business are just ask. I just went around asking people appropriately, nicely, nice time. There's an art to the ask and getting. So I will, um, I, what I realized when I was um, that age is that successful people, um, even if they're busy, you know, fall in love with authentically ambitious young people. Mm. And I had all these people that um, I cold called who became my evangelists and my supporters. You know, I remember um, I was bugging this gentleman from Pfizer Corporation forever because Mm -hmm. I get a small piece, a very big opportunity versus a Mm -hmm. small thing that can't grow. So I wanted any small piece of any big corporation at the time. And this guy, I remember he called me from an airport running to a plane 
And he was like, Jen, I got you a project. I mean, he was so excited to get me that project. <laughs> I had bugged him so much in the nicest way and we got to know each other. And he's, he started to really understand that I was authentically ambitious, authentically passionate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I can count the number of people I've met like that on one hand, mm -hmm. where, like, this is a young entrepreneur that I want to support because they're, they've got it, you know, they're, yes. and they're, they're tenacious and they're hardworking and they're authentic. And, um, so, you know, I would say, I always say to women, I'm the story of building a pretty awesome empire. That's where I am now out of nothing. Um, mm. just out of asking, you know, most people in my profession, they, you know, they're at Goldman Sachs and then they start their firm or they, right. they were somewhere right. where they acquired credibility. They acquired a network. Um, I don't really have any of those things, but Grit and hustle takes care of a lot. <laughs> that is so true. And I love what you said that just ask are the most powerful words in business. And it is so, so true. And, you know, the women that we work with who go through our accelerator, you know, struggle with that, struggle with the idea of asking. Um, and you, you mentioned how there's an art to asking and building, kind of gaining access to influential leaders and people. Share a little bit about what that means. And, you know, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but when you say, you know, just ask and there's an art to it, you know, there is a finesse to it. So how would you break that down for somebody? Yeah, I mean, listen, I believe that all business development is giving gifts. You mm. give to receive. It's not a one-sided arrangement. So mm -hmm. you try to give a gift before you, you um, expect anything to come back. Mm -hmm. It could be the gift of an insight. It could be the gift of a network. It mm -hmm. could be the gift of knowledge, you know, any of these things. So that's important to understand is like, think about what the other person kind of gets out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but on the asking, you know, it is timing and it is having a high degree of emotional intelligence and knowing mm -hmm when it's the time. So I'll give you an example, but some of, sometimes the time is immediate. Like, mm -hmm. so I remember this story. I was, I went to um, a networking round table with a bunch of, you know, older seasoned, very influential decision makers. And I was chatting with this guy up who ran an architectural advisory firm, a big global one. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking like you would like, anybody you just met and sat mm -hmm. next to. And we left the event together. We went down the elevator together. We went to the street level. Um, and we got to the corner where we were both going to go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. And he was very, super friendly, very engaged, like asked me a lot of questions about what I do, my business. So we had already just talked about what we do. Mm -hmm. And at that street corner, like I had the decision to make whether to just say goodbye and nice to meet you or to make a small ask. And I just said before I parted, you know, listen, it's been so nice to meet you. I know we've talked about what I do. I run a PR firm. So if you ever need reputation management help, let me know. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh my gosh, we're looking for a PR firm right now. Like, like mm -hmm. talking about our business, he wasn't connecting the dots that way. And he was more than happy to put me in on the list. Now, again, mm -hmm. he wasn't gifting me the business on the street. Right. I have to eat for it. But, you know, getting in the door is the first challenge. Um, yes. So like that was an example of if I didn't ask and I just shook his hand and went away. And by the way, that man was a client for nine years. So it's, there's so many different scenarios. Like, you mm -hmm. know, we have a hundred of when it's, appropriate to ask, but I think listening, getting mm -hmm. to know the person, giving to receive, but I think sometimes it's appropriate, like in the immediate, mm -hmm. you know, if you had a friendly conversation with somebody at the end of it, just say, Hey, I'm looking for business. Like I run a firm. You may or may not know somebody it's, you can't assume that just because you're having a conversation, the person's connecting the dots to exactly. actually what you need. You know, right. it's like they say in every relationship, how can the other person read your mind and know what you need? 
And I also say like, you know, what is the worst thing that could happen when you ask? Somebody mm -hmm. says, no, who cares? Move on. I also have a mantra called solve, don't dwell. Mm -hmm. So I'm not somebody who dwells on anything. I put all my energy into solving problems. So if somebody says no to me, I just move on. It yes. doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think that is such an, um, you know, an amazing mantra of like solve, don't dwell because you know, research has shown time and time again, women ruminate on their, yeah. you know, mistakes or those types of things. And then they get stuck in this kind of inertia. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about that when you, you know, how did you learn to just not dwell or when something does kind of like, ugh, like you have a little bit of that tinge of like, I can't believe I did that or did this. Yeah. How do you get past it? How do you just say, okay, water under the bridge, let's keep going. Yeah. It doesn't mean you shouldn't reflect and analyze and ask yourself, how could I do better next time? That's mm -hmm. important. Um, right. But I think, um, you know, I read this book once about the voice inside your head. And mm -hmm. I realized I was born with a pretty positive voice inside my head. The voice mm -hmm. inside my head does not say, Jen, you stupid idiot, you should have done that differently. Mm -hmm. So part of it is taming the voice inside your head. Mm -hmm. I have a naturally optimistic voice and a relatively supportive voice, but you have to sort of knock that out. Um, mm. um, I think that's so important. So yes. the first thing is like, you're your worst enemy. Um, believe me, you women evaluate themselves so much tougher than the external world. And I think you have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I always say to women in my firm, figure out how to make that voice more neutral, but also figure out what gives you confidence mm. because confidence, you know, so fast forward, I'm 23. I figure out, I didn't figure it out in the beginning. I would take any business in the beginning, but then I figured out hmm, there's this whole underserved world of financial services firms that are mm. really conservative. One day they're going to wake up and smell the marketing. I know it. So like I was trying to shift my world into financial services because I thought it, there was a white space. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out, again, I'm in my 20s. I don't have a finance degree. I don't know anyone in financial services. So my big fix was like, get an MBA at a great school. You'll graduate with a network. You'll have a credential that people mm -hmm. admire, especially in the communications world. Um, but, you know, I always say, what did that MBA really do for me? It gave me confidence. Like I walked mm -hmm. in rooms differently because I felt like, you know what? I took that same stats class you did or that finance class you did. Yes. or um, And that was like a magical thing. Like, I'm not sure I ran the business any better because of my MBA or I'm not even sure. Yeah, the network was great. Mm -hmm. I was always good at building my own network it was the confidence I had of myself. So, you know, whether it's, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's like that handbag that makes you feel like a badass yes. or, just, <laughs> or I don't care what it is, but you have to figure out what makes me feel confident um, in rooms. Because once you get that confidence and you tame the voice inside your head, asking becomes easy because maybe only 50% of the time people say yes, but when they say no, you can move on from it easily. You mm -hmm. don't, you don't dwell. And I guess on the solve don't dwell, I realized very early in life that your emotional energy is so important to conserve. Mm. Yes. And if you waste it on something you can't really change or have control of anyway, what is the point to that? Mm -hmm. And could put all your that precious energy into solving something, mm -hmm. um, then good things happen after that. But you're right. Um, I observe this in my own workforce. Women do dwell more. They do beat themselves up more than men. Men kind of brush it off and move on. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn from that. It's right. a good trait. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this, you know, leads a little bit into, like you had mentioned, you know, the, the whole confidence and the power identity, right. Of like, what makes you feel powerful. And like you said, if it's that handbag, that's the, the shoes, whatever it is that helps you become more confident, that's what you need. But then it, you know, just segueing that into personal brand, mm -hmm. because if you are someone who's dwelling all the time and who's not going out there and putting out the ask, and not 
coming across as, you know, confident and powerful, um, that can be a detriment. So, and given your world in PR, right, you're all about yeah. managing other people's brands. And sometimes when you have to help them dig out from <laughs> um, something that, you know, maybe their brand has been tarnished a bit. What is the key to building a strong personal brand or reputation personally, professionally, and in yeah. some cases for, for just, you know, organizations as a whole? What is key? I think it's key to know what, what do you want the market to think about you? What does mm -hmm. your brand stand for? What are the words? If you were to put a word cloud together, what are the words that would stand out? You know, I hate my headshot and I met this photographer the other day and he asked me such a <laughs> great question. He said, what, how do you want to come across? What are the words you would use? And I'm like, Ooh, good question. And I said, can these things go together? But I want to be fierce, but approachable. Mm. And we talked about fierce and approachable and like how we get those two things to come across in the image, mm -hmm. um, what you should be wearing, what you should be, you know, and um, I thought that was a really insightful question. And it's not very different from mm -hmm. your whole personal branding exercise. It's like, what does your brand stand for? What are the words you would use to describe yourself? And how do you put yourself out there um, to create that, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's your LinkedIn feed or your LinkedIn content, or it's your speaking engagement, or it's your you know, long, long form article that you write, or how do all those things always include that something that gives you that feel, right? Right. So, um, you know, at Prosec, my firm, we talk a lot about grit, hustle, and humanity. Mm. I want those things to be part of my brand. I would like when clients talk about us or employees or whatever for that feeling to come mm. that, you know, we hustle, we've got grit, but we also have humanity. Um, so, and there's a lot more words that are important to me about my business, but we try to portray those things, whether it's mm -hmm. our website or our social channels or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it's that same philosophy, whether it's a personal brand or a company brand. Mm -hmm. Just defining those keywords and what you want to be known for and staying true to those. Yeah. What's the story? Also, what's the story? You know, I would, you know, not that I manufactured it. It's true. Like my coming up story is full of grit, hustle, and humanity, right? And that's mm -hmm. my part of my personal brand and it's part of my- Your values, work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Values and my company values too, mm -hmm. um, which is why it's really important to understand what you stand for and align it to where you work or, or what you do. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And that's so powerful in the sense of, you know, you have to define it and then that way you can actually emulate it and, and use those words in your communications as well, right? So that it becomes you. Um, and so defining it is so important. Now, you certainly have um, created um, an enormous reputation for your company. I mean, you know, 2021 Forbes, America's best PR agencies, you know, you've consistently been top 25 in New York Observer's power list. Um, and then you personally have all has all have also been named as like top financial communications, in, you know, in the US, you know, by insider. Now, there is a level of consistency there that is undeniable. And, you know, it, it goes to your career success. So what are what are some of these, you know, daily habits, rituals that you personally do to maintain, you know, such a high level of career success, but then also for your firm, how do you make sure that trickles down to, you know, everybody in your firm? What are some habits, rituals that you constantly um, hold on to? Sure. I mean, I think early, early, early days, we defined these sort of like business behaviors mm -hmm. that like the solve, don't dwell, the just ask. I've got like mm -hmm. 20 of those and everybody knows what they are. Mm -hmm. um, you hear them in the hallways at the firm. So I think keeping that alive is really, really important. And as we have the next generation and the next generation of people, just bringing them up using those business behaviors. I think mm -hmm. the business behaviors has created the consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I actually wrote a book in 2011 called The Army of Entrepreneurs. That's what we call our culture. Mm -hmm. And keeping that Army of Entrepreneurs spirit alive mm. is like daily obsession. So right. um, there's nothing more important than your company culture, nothing. And you can lose it so easily. 
but I think, you know, figuring out what are the behaviors that are important to us and just kind of over communicating and hammering those behaviors and celebrating successes around those behaviors is really, really important. So that's kind of like how we try to keep the consistency in the firm. Um, you know, also we're, we kind of know what we're trying to hire in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. we want more entrepreneurial type people. We want, you know, so mm -hmm. we kind of figured out the matches and that's helpful too. I think it took us a decade to figure out how to hire right, mm -hmm. how to hire against those business beliefs, but now we've kind of got that down. So there's a consistency in terms of my per personal rituals. Um, I am like the biggest believer in sleep. Mm. I, I mean, I will forego anything to get seven plus hours of sleep. Um, mm. Our work is so rigorous, especially on the uh, crisis communication side. Mm -hmm. And the 24 seven, you are always on call. You're, and the complexity of the reputational problems we're solving is, you know, no, not everyone is the same. Um, right. So you kind of have to have your brain firing at high capacity. I don't, I don't know. I think there's a couple people in the world that can break that rule of sleep, but um, I tend to think that's BS. I tend to think <laughs> you need, you need to recharge. So I'm a big believer in sleep. Um, I'm a big believer in exercise. You know, I had a surgery a few years, a uh, few weeks ago, I couldn't exercise for two weeks. Ooh, I realized I am motivated by, mm. you know, that exercise routine um, for, for a lot of reasons. So um, I'm a regular exerciser, good sleeper. Um, you know, I think in our world, you have to be like a obsessive reader. Mm, so yes. I'm always reading and, you know, um, I know a pretty good futurist and she said, you know, to be a great futurist, you, you need not to just read what you're you should read or what you're used to, you need to read in all categories. So like, if you love finance, you should be reading pop culture, you know, you should be mm -hmm. reading stuff that you would never read because you can't connect the dots create creativity mm. if you're not reading in many, many categories. So that is a big part of my world is just trying to find the time to consume everything I possibly can. Those are all rituals. And I have a 13 year old daughter and um, I'm very um, pretty, you know, it's important that I spend time with her. I mean, COVID has been a blessing in some ways because mm -hmm. it's kept me off the road, but you know, we do little things together all the time. And I believe in the power of little things like mm -hmm. you know, stopping your day to play Scrabble and like really p playing Scrabble, like not looking at your phone and concentrating on someone. It's right. little that takes a half hour here, a half hour there. I really think kids value and, and remember the little things. There was actually a story in the New York Times this this year about parenting and COVID and how hard it would, and like it talked about women beating themselves up because they just have so many responsibilities and they feel like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm always at my kids, I'm always I'm angry, I'm negative. And, and she said, you know, the research shows that kids remember the little things. They don't remember mommy yes. was angry here. They remember, mommy played Uno with me every day, or whatever it is. So, right. um, I think that that's a really big part of my belief system too. Is like the little things. I think that's fantastic, and it's so true. Sometimes it's the most subtle things that have the most significant impact, and so definitely taking the time to to do that, and it it almost re-energizes and recharges you too, just like sleep. Oh, so, I and, and saying thank you, you know, I have alumni that come out of the woodwork every year write me a LinkedIn email. I had one the other day, someone who worked at my firm over 11 years ago. She's like, I always remember when you stopped your day to call me and say, thank you on this first project I did. And, you know, she was just sort of saying, never kind of worked at another place where anybody like the founder stopped their day to call me and say, thank you on something esoteric that I thought you never knew about. Right. Mm -hmm. that, what is that worth? I mean, it takes no time and it has such big impact so I think mm -hmm. in addition to little things like with my child I really try to pay attention to the people that work for me and like mm -hmm. kind of swoop in when they don't expect with something some observation or some thank you and the appreciation thing like you know it, 
it can't be underscored how powerful that is. It's absolutely powerful. I think it's the, you know, just that, um, the recognition of their value, right? It, it basically, um, lets them know that you value them in the smallest ways, just that small yeah. thank you can be so powerful. That is fantastic. Now you talked a little bit about um, crisis situations and things like that. And sometimes with you know women that we're working with or that we're coaching or even in my career in corporate and talking to individuals, um, sometimes it, it was interesting when there was a, some sort of mistake or something that happened. And in their minds, it's this huge crisis situation. How would you tell someone like if they've had a big blunder, what is the easiest, fastest way to kind of like recoup from that? Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, it's owning up to owning your role. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if it, requires an apology, making an authentic apology. Now, mm -hmm. there have been so many scandals lately and so many apologies. Apologies aren't ringing as true as they used to. Mm -hmm. so there has to be a lot of, just like the just ask, there's a lot of care and strategy around how do you, how do you apologize in a way that comes across as authentic and not mm -hmm. inauthentic. But I do think owning mistakes, um, you know, I'm sorry to see, I always said that the US was the, the most magical place for um, reinventions mm -hmm. in business. You know, you see a lot of people, Michael Milken went to jail and now he's one of the most beloved philanthropists, right? So right. I like that about the US because I believe in second chances. Mm -hmm. I see a lot less of that now. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of second chances right now, right. Um, which is a little sad. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think, listen, authentically apologizing, owning the mistake, if it's really severe, stepping, knowing when to step down and step out and let the organization thrive without mm -hmm. you taking a break, mm -hmm. reintroducing yourself later, um, all of these things. So it really depends on the situation and how severe, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I think owning mistakes, listen, I had a really embarrassing situation. You know, we have about I guess six offices and mm -hmm. I guess we've been in the virtual world, but one of the offices had a physical get together. So I went to say hello and I haven't met a lot of those people. And mm -hmm. um, I shook the hand of one of these guys. Like I, I email all the time, but I've never seen his face. I've never been in his presence mm -hmm. and I called him the wrong name. And I just have to say, I felt like such an idiot. And the next day I woke up and I wrote him a note and I said, look, you've been on my mind all night. I feel like an idiot. I want you to know how much I value your work. You're in my inbox every day with your fabulous work. And I've just never met you in person. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. He said, like, like the nicest, like, don't worry about it. But I'm sure I just felt like I should own up to that. Right. And tell him that it bothered me all night because it did. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that I'm not a big believer on sweeping things under the rug and assuming and mm -hmm. the other person or whatever there's no harm in sort of owning up and saying you know I'm sorry and I you know one of the lines in the email was sometimes the big boss just really f's it up you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen I think I was off the hook already but I'm sure that he appreciated that right yeah, that is a fantastic example because I think it's those examples that sometimes individuals allow them to completely derail them. Yeah. And I love how you said, you know, yes, it bothered you, um, but you didn't let it happen for more than 24 hours where then you took action, you owned the, the mistake and you apologized and you added some levity to it as well, right? Yeah. But I think the action that you took and, and saying it's okay, like we're all human, we mess up. But I love the example because that's an everyday example. And I think it happens that that example probably happens to people all the time, but they, and it beats themselves up and then they, it stops them from having opportunities or moving forward with that person. Yes. And I think back to the solve, don't dwell. That was my solve. And it allowed me not to think about it anymore because I felt mm -hmm. like, you know, there's two outcomes. One, the person is probably a reasonable human being and lets me off the hook mm -hmm. or two, it's an unreasonable human being who will never get over it. And that's not really something I can control. Mm -hmm. So I think taking action is not just because 
I deserve, I mean, that person deserved that, mm -hmm. but it was also selfishly for me because mm -hmm. I wanted to move on from the incident and not feel awkward around this person for the rest of my life, right? right. But too many people don't take the action and they carry it in their heads and they make it a big deal and they wonder what the person's feeling. And it just feels like that's not a great outcome. Yeah, that is fantastic. So let's switch gears a little bit. And I have a question around, you know, you um, certainly know how to execute and do things. And I think that's prob probably part of your mantra as well as solve, don't dwell, right? So yeah. what are some tips that you can share on effective execution? Like when you set a goal and you know that it may be a lofty goal, how do you execute on it or on a project or something that might be yeah. difficult? Well, one thing is, you know, and everyone has trouble with this. I, I certainly did earlier in my career, but it's like, you need to focus on the goal, mm -hmm. not get too entangled with um, esoteric side projects and say yes to everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, I always, this is another genism, but like, I'm always asking, is it nice or is it necessary? Mm -hmm. Like, you have to stop doing some of the nice and do the necessary to hit any goal, mm -hmm. especially with all the demands going on. You need to find a way to separate the nice from the necessary, say no to the things that are not on goal. Um, and, you know, I'm like, where I trip up is, you know, someone will ask me to do something that sounds so amazing. Well, of course I should take that on, blah, 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 but it doesn't fit the focus of my goal. Mm. And it doesn't fit, you know, sometimes when it's a business thing, it doesn't fit the machine, meaning it doesn't fit what we do as a firm. Mm -hmm. So it, I might, it might sound really sexy and I might want to do it, but you know, you could see the movie. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm not going to have time. And then I'm going to feel bad. And then I'm going to feel guilty. You know, you have to sort of, so I would say, you know, you got to focus and um, separate the nice from the necessary. And you do have to execute. Listen, doers get things done. Mm -hmm. Too many people want to strategize and strategy is important, but guess what? Execution is just as important. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my partners, when he joined is like, I've never seen anyone get down their list like you, like, cause I'm a doer. I'm not afraid to roll up my sleeves and do what has to get done to get to the goal. Um, and then I think it's also important to be able to call the ball if you're not going to get there. You know, every once in a while we set a goal and we're just not going to get there. And I think it's, I think it's more admirable to be the person to put up your hand and be like, you know what? We set this goal. We're not going to get there. Mm -hmm. But if we want to get there, maybe we do these five things, right? Sometimes we take something on or we, we make a goal that's too lofty. Mm -hmm. um, like I have someone's review coming up and she has not made the big goal. Mm -hmm. And I wish you would come to me now and be like, I'm not making that goal. And that's the big goal, of my mm -hmm. year. And what should we do about that? Should we reset my review back a few months? Should we this, should we that? That to me would be more admirable than like, just like, all right, let's show up with this uncomfortable review with a big elephant in the room on the goal, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, not to have too many. Too. Right. Back to right. What are the ones that have to happen? Mm -hmm. um, so don't have too many, don't say yes to everything. Don't be afraid to say you're not gonna achieve it. And don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, I'm not gonna achieve yes. this. Can we brainstorm? Yes. Um, someone might have a really great idea to how to get there. So all of those things. I would also say, um, I read this great book, you know, in business school, they make you read good to great or whatever it is. Yes. Jim, Collins. Jim Collins put out another book called I think it was called great by choice, but there's a concept in there about luck moments. And he says, you know, every successful leader has the same amount of good and bad luck moments, mm -hmm. but the really great ones know when they're in a good luck moment, they focus and they max it out and they don't get distracted. Right. And in a bad luck moment, they're actually sometimes good at turning a bad luck moment into a good luck moment. My whole career is a bad luck moment into a good luck moment. I always remind people like that crappy, like that recession, mm -hmm. the startup with the bad office and the terrible clients and whatever that ended up being like the most awesome thing. I mean, not that yeah. maybe I could be 
a president of somebody else's company, but instead I own my own. And that would not have happened um, if not for that bad luck into good luck moment. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that reminds me, we have a saying here at Beyond Barriers that your obstacles are your opportunities, that mm -hmm. you know you will rise beyond those obstacles and that becomes that's your true. opportunity. Absolutely. Yes. This is fantastic. Well, in closing, I love to ask this question all the time mm -hmm. and thinking about you know this digital age, digital disruption, things are always changing. What advice would you give the listeners to our podcast of how do you continue to accelerate your success um, in a world that's constantly changing? Yeah, I think it goes back to that trying to be your own personal futurist and seeing around corners and really listening to the market and what's changing um, and trying to get ahead of those things. Um, you know, if you're an avid reader, you're probably pretty up to speed on, you know, what the predictable changes are gonna be in our lives. There's the unpredictable changes like no, no one could have called COVID really. Right. Although my friend, the futurist had a whole paper <laughs> on global pandemics like three uh -huh. years ago. Um, and I was like, that's not going to happen. Well, it did. Um, <laughs> so like, if I listened to that, maybe I would have thought through the pandemic, but that was a pretty big left fielder. But some of the other things are not left field, right? There's sort of big trends. So mm -hmm. instead of don't put your head in the sand on those big trends and trying to figure out like, how am I going to recreate myself when that thing happens? Mm, right. Yes. Um, you know, we're a funny fish of a firm because we predicted what became an emerging market. I call it the emerging market of my, the emerging market of marketing is financial institutions, right? Mm -hmm. but they're like halfway through an emerging market. So soon it'll be a mature market for mm -hmm. what we do. What are we going to do then? Mm -hmm. So that's what, what I'm thinking. I'm not just in the moment of like, oh my God, business is amazing because we've got an emerging market. That's true, but all emerging markets mature and soon it will be like, okay, everybody is, used to what we do mm -hmm. how are we going to be ahead of them again on mm. the next wave of modernity or whatever right. you call it so i'm always obsessing about like what what could just really derail us and what are the predictable that's very predictable the market will mature mm -hmm. right so shame on us if we're not ahead of that right? right um same with all this digital disruption and technology i mean if we're not obsessing about like what could AI do and emerging technologies do that, you know, we do now that's silly. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not thinking about those obvious things, you're sort of asking for a disruption um, mm -hmm. because you're going to be hit with the things you can't predict. Um, but I think if you build a muscle for agility, yes, um, you have a much better chance. Um, like the companies that pivoted very quickly in COVID were the companies that were very agile already. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember giving, I was asked to give this presentation to a private equity firm, like all their rainmakers, their super mm -hmm. deal doers, like maybe three weeks after, you know, all businesses had shut down in COVID. Right. And it was a conference call. And I'm like, are you guys not on Zoom? <laughs> like, no, or some video, whatever. And I'm like, you're rainmakers. You've got to sit behind a screen and figure out how to build relationships do you think that's going to happen over a conference call when everyone else is on video? Like, I don't even need to give my presentation. You should stop it and like, hurry up <laughs> and get the technology you need to do business development in a virtual world. Like, mm -hmm. so like there were shocking, shockingly there were firms that have not pivoted quickly into, not that there aren't deficiencies in this video right. world, but I did a lot of business this way. I think everybody else did. So, you know, there were like, quick movers and not quick movers. So mm -hmm. I would assume that particular firm doesn't pivot easily and that's not good. Right. Um, it kind of is, I think, indicative of, can you face the bigger trends and, and the unknowns, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think that's so important, that agile mindset. But I think what was really resonating to you is constantly thinking about how do you innovate to stay ahead? Yeah. And that is something that I think sometimes people get caught on their heels where they're just caught in the day to day and they're not yeah. thinking about what's the wave, you know, what's the wave that's coming. And if you're looking out for the wave, you can ride the wave. Otherwise it's going to crash right on top of you. I mean, we had a very good example. So 
we just invested in a women-led ESG consultancy that is really doing management consultants, mm-hmm. management consulting versus communications. We've mm-hmm. been doing ESG communications forever. But I'm like, look, for my asset management clients, if I partner with them, not only can I do the communications, I can build the programs, build mm-hmm. the investment products, do the high-end measurement programs. And that's what our clients really need. And that will put us ahead, right? So yes. we did this deal. Two weeks before the deal was announced, um, a very large client of ours was this close to going with another firm on their ESG business. Mm-hmm. And we swooped in and we're like, what are you doing? Give us a shot. Mm-hmm. And I brought in this gal and her team and whatever. And they were like, oh my God, we had no idea you had this. That other firm doesn't have that. We swooped in and took it out of the jaws of death, you know, right. back into our world. So I said to my partners, if we hadn't innovated with that move to partner Mm -hmm. with ESG consulting firm, we would have lost that business um, because we would have looked exactly the same as the competitor. Mm -hmm. Um, So you always have to be, so that was part of the, like an obvious trend, right? ESG, everyone's obsessed with it. Do something. (laughs) (laughs) That wasn't a, like, that was a no brainer, but I think a lot of other firms, they just keep rolling out the same old thing and they think, the customers are going to just keep liking the same old thing. That doesn't happen. That's fantastic. And yes, that's a perfect example of how, you know, yes, ESG is on top of everybody's mind and they don't know how to handle it. And you're, and you innovated to say, I solved. So you're solving for them and you're thinking about the solution and staying ahead. I think that is fantastic. Well, Jennifer, this has been such an amazing com- conversation, so insightful. I know that our listeners are going to want to probably follow and hear more of your Jenniferisms. <laughs> so what is the best way for individuals to say connected with you, follow you? Yeah. So I write a, a newsletter on LinkedIn called Leadership in Volatile Times. Mm-hmm. So most of my observations and isms, like I post a couple times a week. So if you're interested, would love to have you follow my content. It'd be great. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for giving us your time and to our Beyond Barriers listeners. And we look forward to staying connected and following you on LinkedIn. Thank you. Can't thank you enough. This is so fun.